Stay hungry, stay foolish. In 1880, George Eastman invented and patented a dry plate formula and a machine for preparing large numbers of plates. He also founded the Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York. In 1884, he replaced glass photographic plates with a roll of film, believing in the future of the film business. Like many startups, Kodak faced severe challenges in the early days, but soon became a household name. When selling cameras, Kodak used a razor blade strategy, selling the cameras for a low cost, fueling growth and profits from the film. With success came blind spots, and little by little, Kodak leadership paid less and less attention to hardware. This was the case despite Eastman's original guiding principles. Mass production at low cost. International distribution. Extensive advertising, customer focus, and growth through continuous research. Kodak did spend a lot on R&D, but lacked an appetite to bring the findings from that R&D to life. And this would contribute to the downfall of an iconic company. Don't forget Kodak have remarkable engineers, amazing innovators and extremely intelligent people running the business. It is hard to imagine today a world without the smartphone, Instagram, a world where only one company dominated an industry, a world where it was a chore to capture a moment. This was the world in 1975 when a young 24-year-old engineer invented digital photography and built the world's first digital camera. It is a great pleasure to welcome that inventor, the man who brought us the digital camera, Steve Sasson. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Steve, before we discuss your time at Kodak, let's start with the Sasson backstory. As a kid in Brooklyn, you were a tinkerer, always hacking together whatever raw materials you could lay your hands on. Let's share how this interest in engineering, which would eventually manifest as the digital camera, came about. Like you mentioned, I, I grew up in, in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn, and um, I lived in a row house. Uh, and uh, my, my father uh, was a longshoreman, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and, and was also a secretary. So we pretty solid class, middle, middle class upbringing, I would say. Um, and, and I got interested in, in building things. I, a, a neighbor of mine, whose name was Don Reinerson, is a well-known author as well in the United States uh, on innovation. Uh, he and I used to uh, tinker with things. Uh, we first started doing chemistry experiments. And of course, that can create all kinds of problems because when you're young boys, what do you do with chemistry? You like to make things explode. And uh, so we would we would do some rather dangerous things. Now, back now probably would be illegal. But uh, in any case, uh, started there and then got interested in electronics. And I was probably 12 or 13. So this is in the early 1960s. And um, uh, I just got interested in in, in radios and, and transmitting things. I became a ham radio operator, uh, put up a, a, an antenna on the roof of our row house, which and I would transmit Morse code to other ham radio operators, which, of course, had a, a, a negative effect on all the television sets that were in the lock as well. So that created a little bit of a social problem. Um, but uh, I liked that. It was it was it was fun. And I, I just built things and sort of this is where I got the habit, two, two habits that served me uh, later on in my, my career. Uh, one is I, I, if I had an idea, I built it. Um, so I express myself through the actual physical implementation of a, of a circuit or, a, or, or, a, or some, some kind of a device. And the other uh, thing that I picked up was the, the, the idea of going around and scrounging parts. Uh, living in Brooklyn, what people used to do is throw away their old electronic television sets, radios, old stereos. They'd throw them out on the curb and for the garbage men to come and pick them up on a certain day. And I would wander around the neighborhood and drag these things home and do autopsies on them, basically, <laughs> to remove the parts. And that's where I got my parts to build my my my, my ideas. Okay, And they were silly things. I First thing I ever built was what I called a do-nothing box, where I took my father's shaving kit and and 
drilled holes in it and put neon lights in it. And they blinked in a random order, just like they did in the old science fiction movies. I thought that was so cool, you know, but that was the kind of thing I started out doing. And then I worked my way to amplifiers and transmitters and oscillators and things like that. Um, and so I got very interested in that. And, and that's kind of what I did as a hobby. Um, and, and then that fostered an interest in elect electronic technology. And this was the age of, you know, the space race and communications at a distance. And, and so it was sort of the in thing to be interested in as well, you know? So, so it was, it all fit together. I, I had an opportunity to go to Brooklyn Technical High School, which was uh, one of the crown jewels school uh, schools of uh, of the, the public public education system in New York City you had to take a test to get in there but it was a public school so you didn't have to pay any money to go there um, and it was based in it was it, it fostered technical education scientific education and so it was a nice place for me to go as well and uh, it was there that uh, I, I got a chance to play with a little bit of this stuff and learn a lot of other different types of technology woodworking metalworking that kind of thing all of this stuff comes in helpful when you're trying to develop stuff, you know? So, so I was, I was just fortunate to be in the place that I was uh, living in Brooklyn with all this opportunity around me. Uh, and then when I graduated from Brooklyn tech, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which was a, a very well-known engineering school. And of course I went for electrical engineering and, um, and then uh, I, I went there for four years and I decided to stay for a fifth to get a master's degree. And, uh, and that is where I got interested when I was doing the master's degree uh, about how light affected silicon. Um, this was, um, I was taking a master's uh, course by a well-known professor in the field. And um, he challenged us to write a paper to teach him something, which of course was pretty hard for us to do because he was like really smart. So, so I decided, well, as long as I'm going to fail this course, I might as well learn something myself anyway. So I was interested in this. So I wrote a paper about how light affected silicon. And one of my great joys in life was he asked for a copy of my paper. Uh, you got to understand, I, when I submitted it, I thought I was going to fail. Right? You know? uh, but I was just trying to think out of the box because, you know, and he didn't, he even wrote, I didn't, don't agree with what you've done. You've done some thinking here. And so I, with that piece of encouragement, you know, I, 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 um, I proceeded and I went to work for Eastman Kodak Company, which was a bit of an odd choice for an electronics guy. But it was just, again, the, 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 um, the, the lucky nature of timing. Um, it was uh, right at this time, Kodak traditionally hired engineers that were mechanical or chemical engineers because most of the technologies associated with cameras have to do with either the formulation of emulsions and consumable materials or the equipment that used them. And they were usually mechanical marvels. So cameras back in the 19, early 1960s and 70s were mechanical marvels. They were just wonderful pieces of mechanical engineering. But more of the unit manufacturing course was going into the cost uh, of electronics. So there was more electronics in film advance and uh, exposure control, flash control, things like that. So they decided they needed more electrical engineers. And so uh, they were looking for them and I went there and I found them and, and I found this wonderful little research laboratory that they offered me an opportunity to work in. And it was a wonderful place because it was all different disciplines of technology. Uh, and um, so you were surrounded by physicists and chemists and mathematicians and systems analysis and electrical engineers. And so uh, couldn't find a, a more interesting place to work. And so it was there that I started my career at Kodak in 1973. Beautiful, Steve. And I wanted to come back to a couple of things because the... the one of the things that is so important and is kind of overlooked now, like you think about minimalist living, right? So for example, my wife's a minimalist, we have nothing that doesn't belong anymore. And when when she go, you know, so sometimes she buys things just to throw them out so she can feel minimalist, right? And uh, some of the electronics, right? So when when there's an electronics thing that breaks down, and we live in this throwaway society, unfortunately, I always keep them and give them to my kids because I, I didn't go on the path you went, but that was a joy for me as a kid, getting out the screwdriver, taking things about how does it work and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to touch on that, right? That If we, we think, talk about that in a second. And then the encouragement from that college professor, because the humility of him to say, teach me something. 
and then to actually reward you for thinking because that's what education is about teaching people how to think and rewarding you for that must have encouraged you to keep on that path in the future i think they're two really important nuggets and i'd love you to talk about both of those well let's talk about the the tinkerer part first and and that was definitely true with me i love taking things apart um I love uh, seeing what I could do with things. I, I share, I'll share an example. I don't think I've told this before, but my mom used to have her girlfriends come over and they would come and they would, they would play cards and stuff. There was the girls' night, you know. And um, you know what I used to do is I used to run wires to the stereo speaker because a, a permanent magnet speaker can be used as a microphone as well. And I would listen in to what they were saying. I don't know why I was listening in. I, they weren't talking about me or anything, but it's just something I felt like I could do. And so I would run this wire from the speaker all the way. As long as they didn't turn on the stereo, I could listen to everything that was being said. And this is the kind of thing I would just try, keep trying these things, you know. Uh, and so I would take things apart or look at things that were around me and see what else I could do with them. I didn't have a purpose to it um, other than just a curiosity of seeing how it went together, seeing what it could do, you know, um, just curiosity more than anything else. I, I didn't have an overwhelming uh, desire to, 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 to do something with it. I just needed to understand it. So I ha- always had lots of tools um, and I always had lots of parts and I would get those parts by taking things apart, you know, uh, and uh Sometimes I feel bad. I was taking something apart that I didn't know how it worked when it was supposed to work. I just feel this little guilt thing, you know. I used to go to the library and and, and buy books on electronics or you know, bring books on electronics and bring it back. What age and were I would you? Read those things. What's that? What age were you then? Oh, I was probably about uh, somewhere between 12, 13, 14. That's where I started. Um, I'd go to the library and I'd bring back these books, you know, I'd first be electronics, you know, and then and then I would bring back books on sound and stuff. And I didn't have the mathematical background. I remember getting a book on sound called uh, Sound and Vibration by a fellow named Morse. And it was full of differential equations. And of course, you know, I had gotten to algebra in high school, you know. And so I said, well, I better pay attention to this when I get to it someday, (laughs) because this is the language that people use to describe sound waves. And I really want to understand this. So it sort of, you know, pre-positioned me to to be ready. So when I saw this coming, I didn't get the differential equations until I was a sophomore in college, I think, you know, um, but, but it's sort of, it's sort of like, it, you know, put the appetite there, say, mm-hmm. Hey, pay attention to this. This is not just another course that's coming along. This is another language that I'm going to need to do something that I know that I'm interested in, you know, kind of thing. So that was what the tinkering did for me, you know, and as for the, as for the encouragement, you know, I got so much encouragement. I, I share, I'll share two stories. I, I shared that first story. It happened in my fifth year and his name was Sorhab Gandhi was the name of the professor. He was the head of electrophysics. He seemed like a really smart fellow. And he wasn't, he was a smart fellow and uh, it's kind of a distant kind of a guy. And he was, it was a survey course. He would come in every week and teach us something. So finally, somebody about the fifth week said, well, how are you going to grade us on this course? And he sort of looked up. I remember this. He looked up and he said, Oh, well, thrill me, teach me something, write me a paper by the end of the semester. And that was it, right? And, you know, the chances of us being able to teach him something was nil, right? But anyway, I was interested in how light affected silicon. My master's project was actually, I rode away to GE to get some uh, optical thyristors, uh, that is uh, light controlled SCRs, silicon controlled rectifiers. And I wrote GE Pittsfield and said, I want to build something where I can have a, a moving uh, motor rotating on, on, on the rotor would be have no no connection to the to 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 the, the external world and I would control the flow of current in this rotating armature by optical pulses and they sent me free parts you know and and so, <laughs> so right. I was doing this but this was uh, the paper I was was going to do the research behind this the science and the theory behind how these devices worked you know so there's the building of the thing that's the old Stevo, right? And, you're, and then the new Stevo is I'm in college and I should both know this stuff. And Gandhi is teaching us, I should, so I'm going to try to try to do this. And I and I thought for sure, you know, what I was thinking about here was was incorrect. And he wrote just wrote me the nicest note. Which, by the way, I'm I'm kind of a I don't I'm not a pack rat. I don't keep stuff, but I kept this report. 
Uh, and uh, I was invited back to RPI. Uh, they were very kind to give me a, a, an achievement award and put me in their Hall of Fame. And then they asked me to give a talk. And at the beginning of the talk, I held up, I took out this paper and I showed them the note. And I said, this is from Gandhi, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, and it, 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 I was just trying to point out that it's important for anybody who's teaching in college or high school or anything that your, 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 your comments matter to people, uh, mattered to me because I took a step and he encouraged me, even though I wasn't correct on a lot of stuff I was writing. He said, you've done some thinking here. I want a copy of this paper. Um, take a look at my notes in here. You know, you can see where I have disagreements. Um, and, and that was enough coming from someone with his stature. So I don't know if a direct correlation, but a couple of years later, when someone challenged me to pick up a CCD, which I knew nothing about and try something, I said, let me try it. And I think, you know, you get those kinds of encouragement that helps you make the next, next leap. So so, so important. It's what, that's what that's one story. There's many others. I had some great professors at RPI. I had uh, Dr. Robert Resnick, who was a very famous physics author, and he would come into recitation every week and ask us what problems we had. And he would go and he would come in with no notes. And I, you know, I'd spent hours trying to do these physics problems, and I'd have formulas running up and down the page and everything. And then he somebody read out the problem and he would write, you know, F equals MA. And in three lines, he had the whole thing figured out. And he just, it was so elegant. It was like, it was like being on the basketball court with Michael Jordan. You know, yeah. these guys are doing incredible things and they look so easy. I, I would literally go back to my dorm room and redo the very same problems, just like to pretend I was like him, you know, because it was just so elegant, you know? So these kinds of people were, were just head and shoulders above most of the, people I've had an opportunity to, to take courses from. And they inspired me and they taught me how to think, how to, how to simplify, how to keep asking the right questions. because That's the key to success. And uh, so, you know, I was very fortunate to, to be exposed to these kinds of people. So let's bring it back then to the story. Then. So, so you're 1973, you joined Kodak, you're 22. I was 23. I was 23. 23. So you're 23 year old joining uh, Kodak, this great company, like you said, you had other prospects probably could have been better off, you know, in your mind, or where others would have gone would have been HP or something like that. But you didn't, you go to Kodak and as luck would have it. But I wanted to give a feel for the organization at the time how successful this business was, how it had forged a path. Because I mentioned in the intro, there was a clear inf emphasis on the cash cow, which was film. It was on consumables. That's where you made your money. That's where you made your profits from. And Kodak was the imaging company in the entire world. You had no competition. If anybody reared their ugly head, they were blown out of the water. They didn't even try for a long, long period of time. But that's the Kodak into which you joined. I love to get a feel of the vibe of the word on the street, how it felt to be in such an iconic company. It was terrific. I mean, to get a job at Kodak, a lot of people considered, in, in certainly locally in Rochester, um, if you got a job at Kodak, you had a job for life kind of a thing. Now, I wasn't from Rochester, so I came from outside, but 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 still, it was just a stimulating environment. The, the research lab I was working in was an applied research lab, interdisciplinary, all these different groups interacting. Uh, really smart people. Um, you, you just couldn't ask for a, for a, for a better place for a young engineer to try stuff, you know. And um, they had, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Kodak added a lot. Even in the '60s, they did a lot of government work. Uh, you know, all these spy satellites, for example. You know, where do you think the optics came from? You know, <laughs> uh, or, or or lunar orbiter, for example. You know, the thing, the program that 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 actually scanned the surface of the moon to get ready for man landings. They had to really carefully document the surface of the moon. What? Kodak was the, the organization that, that, that built all of the imaging systems for that. And it was very innovative stuff. Um, so, so this was, this was a, just a place full of people doing some really interesting and state-of-the-art stuff. Um, and you, know, you were proud to be part of Kodak. Um, it, it's a great company legacy. 
And and by the time I got there, the company had been in existence for almost a hundred years. Yeah. Know? So so it had a long legacy and and then a well established uh, public um, persona. You know, everybody liked everybody liked Kodak. I remember people always said everybody I met always had some Kodak stock. You know, well they gave Kodak stock to their grandkids. You know, kind of thing. So it was a very warm, feel good kind of a of a, of a company. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was a pleasure to be there. I wanted to jump around a little bit, so because you were there for such a, a large period of time, so you went through in all the way to bankruptcy in 2012. Spoiler alert for those who don't know, <laughs> but but uh, I wanted to just take us a little bit forward because I mentioned about how successful the business was then. Nobody competed, and then when when Fujifilm, who is a magnificent case study and reinvention, when they entered the American market, management initially ignored the slight erosion in market share. They did not believe that the American public would buy another brand. And they were sorely mistaken, because more and more brands, Agfa, etc, started to pop up into the marketplace. Were you aware of that from where you stood within inside the company? How did it feel when that happened? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I would tell you that in most of my career, and anytime you talk to anybody who's a part of such a big infrastructure, Kodak always has the perspective that they experienced, and it may not represent the whole view of it. But from my point of view, uh, first of all, I was mainly interested in this this field of digital imaging, which people didn't back then didn't really care too much about. Um, however, what you certainly heard about the, the the Fuji story when they won the contract for the Olympics, uh, that was that was something that that struck everybody as odd. Now, when you referred to you know when they first entered the United States, this was the beginning of globalism as such, and so the whole idea of a global uh, a global competitor. Uh, coming coming to the United States, for example, and setting up factories, you know, was relatively new. I, I would say that I would say Kodak had a uh, an air of confidence, if not arrogance, to some extent, uh, with respect to their position with respect to film, and certainly in the United States, um, because quite frankly, they had been the established leader in photography for almost a hundred years. Um, people looked to Kodak. You know, if something was new in the photographic field, they'd say, what is Kodak going to do, right? Or what do they say about it kind of thing? So the fact that that Fuji or Agfa was competing with them, and certainly in the early 70s, it was probably um, something that they didn't worry too much about. And I didn't hear much about it in my work. Only when they won the contract, I can't remember what year it was, but it was one of the Olympics when they won the contract for that. That was that was something that rippled through and sort of woke everybody up with respect to um, their, the, you know, Fuji's importance and, and, and aggressiveness with respect to the field we were in. Before we come to your invention and how that came about, I wanted to remind our audience of those disposable cameras, and most of them will remember them as Fujifilm fo disposable cameras, the ones that you brought on those stag nights, you brought on the hen, <laughs> the hen party, the nights out, and oftentimes you lost the camera. Oftentimes, they, when you got them uh, actually developed, they were all blurry and they were terrible photos anyway. But Kodak actually claimed the patent to that, so that they actually developed a Kodak, but didn't patent it. And that would make sense because that would affect the whole idea of consumables, it would affect the razor and blade model. I'd love to hear the facts behind that because that's what I've heard, but I don't know if that's actually true. First of all, patents, most of the really important stuff in terms of really important intellectual property was really kept as trade secrets and not necessarily patents. Remember, when you write a patent, you actually write a description of what your invention is, and it becomes public knowledge at some point. You can you can protect it. You can protect somebody from practicing that for a period of time, um, but it becomes public knowledge. So a lot of the stuff with respect to emulsion formulations and some of the secret sauce that goes into making film, and believe me, there is a lot of that, um, was kept as trade secrets. Okay, so, so the idea of patents wasn't... Uh, Although we certainly had a very aggressive patenting, we never really did much with them, as far as I could tell. In other words, if you had a, if we had an argument with Fuji, it seemed to me, and I was not involved in the patent litigation at this point in my career, so I'm just going from the feeling I have, is they wouldn't sue each other. This is a very polite 
business, okay, they 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 basically would meet with Fuji or whoever and say, well, you've got this, we've got that, let's trade here, let's trade there. And, and they would come to some sort of agreement with respect to this. It might be a licensing agreement, formal or informal or whatever. Um, and But they didn't go to court. They didn't bring in a bunch of lawyers and things like that. You know, the only time I heard about that in the 70s, okay, was, was obviously the Polaroid case. Um, and that was that was a, a very expensive patent litigation that had, that had ripple effects throughout the rest of my time in Kodak. Um, but but typically, uh, with respect to Fuji, Agfa, I'm not sure who else, but um, they would settle these things. And so when it comes to the disposable camera that you talk about, um, clearly, yeah, they, they had they had done that and they looked at ways of doing that. And the secret to that, of course, was how cheaply can I build a camera <laughs> so that I could basically give away the camera and then they would send the film in and we would charge them for the processing, you know. Um, and so they did a lot of work on lenses and stuff. I, I worked on a lens cleaning machine uh, very early in my career where and, and I also worked on a machine that would actually finish glass molded lenses, finished glass lens molded lenses without polishing for very small cameras, you know, and this, this was part of the incentive for that is, is how do we, how do we make reasonably good set of optics uh, and in a, a structure, uh, a camera box, a light top box, how could we melt that as inexpensively as possible so that it could be sold inexpensively, could be brought back to the company, torn apart very inexpensively, and then we could make the money by processing the film. Yeah. So there was there was a lot to that. Okay. I, I don't know how big a portion of the business that was, but it certainly was long lasting. I think those single use cameras are <laughs> outlasted, you know, the Kodak's experience in 35 millimeter and <laughs> APS and all the rest. I saw those things on on the tables of, of weddings in the early 2000s you know yeah they're still around man i think they're still going yeah, yeah yeah so so in terms of longevity clearly clearly the winner i guess for those who are watching us on youtube i have a little nod to steve in the, the past here my pin for today i always wear a pin steve that reflects the show is is film which was really difficult to get so i couldn't get a kodak pin by the way and i didn't get in touch with you in time to get one in the post but but i want to jump forward a little bit and then i'm going to come back to the invention because I think this next little passage puts your invention in context. So I'm jumping forward to 1983. The CEO at the time, the chairman, is Colby Chandler. May he rest in peace. He created a division to explore new technologies such as digital imaging then. Kodak hired John White, who had been in the software business, to push Kodak forward. And I've read that White said Kodak wanted to get into the digital business, but they wanted to do it in their own way from Rochester and largely with their own people. That meant it wasn't going to work. The difference between their traditional business and digital is so great. The tempo is different. The kind of skills you need are different. Leadership would tell you they wanted change, but they didn't want to force the pain on the organization. Pain was the shift to digital. I thought that was a core point that I wanted to pull out because that really contextualizes your invention 10 years previously. Well, I would say this is a 1983 quote. Is that what you said? That's right, yeah. That's about right for that time. Um, I would say uh, my work started in 75 and demonstrated the first prototype camera system in 76. And I worked on it continuously the rest of my life, basically. But a lot of other people got started getting involved as well. And Kodak started developing uh, uh, one of the key elements of any system would be uh, charge couple device imagers. These the big chips that would take light and convert them into um, pixels that would correspond to voltage with, a, you know, to, corresponding to how much light was exposed at that point in the, in the disc and the surface. And um, Kodak started building these uh, kind of in secret, really not talking much about it, but building a capability to build these things because they felt that these were the, these were like the electronic version of film. So you can see how, so we, we had a whole building that was devoted to this. Uh, and they, they certainly did a lot of intellectual property on it. Uh, and they started working on them. Uh, in 1983, clearly the potential was there, but it was practically not going to get close to film. And here's, here's one of the things that I think, uh, Mr. White's comment uh, underlined that is something that's not said, but 
but should be understood. And that is that when you have innovation such as dramatic as this, there's the technology itself that's coming along that's going to possibly displace what you're good at, okay? But there's also the problem you're trying to solve. And here, see, Kodak really understood the problem of photography or the challenges faced by photography better than anybody else. In, in 1983, there was a number of people, specifically Sony had talked about introducing the Mavica camera in 81. They were trying to say, well, we're going to replace all of this film junk with, you know, a videotape type solution, but on a disc kind of a thing. And we knew that that was not going to be good enough. You, you just can't come along and say, I've got a new technology and I'm just going to make pictures that are worse than the film pictures because the customer is going to expect the same level of performance using the new technology and taking advantage of the new of the new uh, opportunities offered by the new technology, such as instant preview and sending it over telephone lines and things like that. But I'm not going to take worse pictures, right? So I think that's there's the, there's the technology, and then there's the problem you're trying to solve. Kodak didn't have any experience in the technology, but they knew more about the problem they were trying to solve than anybody else. And so that's why Sony and Canon largely failed in the 1980s as a result of trying to implement their solution on the problem. It wasn't good enough. I did the analysis on that in the early 80s, and I, I, I was very excited for two reasons. One, that, that Sony and Can Canon were making all these no public noises because that got our management off the dime. You know how this all happens. You can be an internal researcher and, and, you know, point, say, hey, there's a problem coming. You know, they don't really pay attention because you're one of them, right? Um, but when somebody else, a major competitor uh, or a major innovative force, not a competitor yet, but an innovative force says they're going to come to eat your lunch, they start paying attention. So that was the good news. And the other piece of good news was the approach they were taking was never going to work. And I had worked out the equations that showed that in addition, they were, good, they were missing parts of the spectrum, uh, the two-dimensional spectrum uh, of, of, of the image uh, that they were uh, sacrificing in order to encode the signal on their disk. So they were trying to take something they understood, which was video, and make it into something that would satisfy the still photographic world. And that was just not going to work, not the way they had approached it. They thought the television set was going to be the solution. See, they, they had their own paradigm they were stuck in as well. So innovation cuts across always, right? They were stuck with the video world. Everything's going to be video. And Kodak said, well, yeah, we don't know much about video, but it's not going to be good enough to replace photography because we know what kind of resolution you get. But we knew more about how pe people like pictures than anybody. We just didn't know how to get there. And, and so, so we knew instead of the TV set being the center of the world, it was going to be the personal computer, which was evolving in 1983 as well. So that's why I ask about the date, because the date is key here. It, it mm. was it was this transition point where, you know, Apple was starting to do some of their, their innovative work. Um, IBM PC was out, as I believe. Um, and, and so people were starting to get grasp this idea of a home computer. An idea of having a computer for the average person in the home was starting to take hold. So Mr. White was probably looking at that and saying, yeah, this is coming. This is not our business, but if it happens, it'll happen here, not on the TV set. Say, and so, so, so that statement has a lot to it. I think. <laughs> Thank you for unpacking it because you you did it brilliantly. I I wanted to come back to so I the reason I'm really interested in a couple of threads. One of the threads is the influencers on you, or the encouragers, or the environment that was created for you to thrive to to come out with these ideas. Then there was the influences, you know, from the teacher, etc. And then there was the organization itself and the, the coming together of those different forces, because at the time you had a supervisor, Garrett Lloyd, and he gave you loads of white space, loads of loose leash. I heard you talking to a friend of the show and supporter of the show on his podcast, Mahan Tavakoli, and he kindly put us in touch. So tip of the hat to you, Mahan. And you said that your supervisor knew so little about what you were doing that when you actually had developed it eventually, He's like, yeah, well, I'll get everybody into the lab to show you. And you're like, going, no, no, this is portable. And in a way, you were kind of shocked that he knew so little about the project that you'd poured your blood, sweat and tears into. That's true. Um, I, my supervisor for the electronics group in this research lab was, was named Gareth Lloyd. 
And, um, you know, he was, he was a truly a great leader. Um, you don't realize it at the time, you know, but, but, but think about this. I had built this photographic system, you know, it looked like a toaster, it was kind of an ugly thing, but it took pictures, available light pictures, digitized them, put them on tape. And then I played them back over a television set, right? So, so it was a whole photographic system. I would wheel it in and I would take pictures in a conference room. Now think about this. If you're in a structure if organization like Kodak and you have this crazy, you know, 25 year old kid that nobody knows who the hell he is demonstrating a system that would completely undermine the entire financial model of which this company was based. And he let me present it. And, you know, usually <laughs> you don't, you don't do those kinds of things, you know, but he did, he, he would come after every presentation, there were many presentations given in the spring of 1976 of the system. And, and uh, it always involved me coming in, taking pictures of people in the room, showing it to them there. And then the questions would start and that kind of thing. And then he would, after each meeting, he would come and give me some pointers on how to make a better presentation or how to answer this question or, you know, who the next group of people is going to be. And he didn't try to get up there and soften it or anything or try to duck it. He just said, you go in and do it. It's your thing. Right. And, uh, you know, I didn't. I thought, well, of course, you know, at the time, but I, I look back at that now after going through a whole career where I managed people and had to manage upper management. That took a lot of guts. Mm. Um, that took a lot of courage. And uh, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think I ever really properly thanked him for that because I didn't realize it, you know, but, but it took a lot of courage and, and we showed it to a lot of important managers. Um, got a lot of questions, you know, uh, and a lot of challenges, uh, which I couldn't answer, you know. But the simple fact was, when they were arguing with me about it, their face was staring at them from the TV screen. I had just taken the picture, you know. So it wasn't like, oh, this couldn't happen. You know, we just the picture wasn't good enough, or the camera was ugly, or you know, that, that was the question: How long is it going to take? You know, and, and quite frankly, I hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking about future strategizing around technology of evolution. Again, going back to the builder kid of me in Brooklyn, right? I got parts. Nobody told me to build this camera. Nobody gave me, I didn't have a project plan. There were no reviews. I, I you know, and they just said, get the CCD, see if you can do something useful with it, you know? And I went around and scrounged parts, all the lenses I got for this thing, or I stole from a manufacturing line down in the factory floor. You know, this was typical Brooklyn, you know, kind of thing. I would just steal all this stuff. <laughs> and by the way, the, the place was loaded with parts. You know, Kodak was a great place to build stuff, you know. So they had a lot of parts. There's very few parts I had to order, you know. So 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 it was really kind of a white space underground activity. Um, and I do, I do, I do want to mention that I had the help of two technicians. One was Bob Dieger, who helped me think about how I wanted to build this camera. We realized that it had to be a camera that would fold up, but it had to unfold because we had to work on it all the time because there was no other place to build this stuff. And then a fellow named Jim Schickler, who who was a technician, but he became an engineer uh, soon after this. Uh, very talented guy, and he kept me sane because we would go in, you know. On, Tuesday night it was working and Wednesday morning it wasn't and we didn't know why kind of thing. And so, so you have to have someone to bounce ideas off of, you know, and so Jim and I worked shoulder to shoulder in that lab to do that, but it was a very small effort. Uh, there was no budget, no reviews. Um, it was just, I would go talk to Gareth every once every two weeks as a normal sit down with your supervisor. And one of the jobs, I had other jobs as well during this time, but Jobs, I would tell him how the camera was going. He would say, great, you know, kind of thing. You know, as long as I didn't, you know, kill anybody or spend too much money, <laughs> it was fine, you know. Um, and that's where that quote came from, because I, I do remember that. I do remember sitting in his lab telling him, yeah, I was excited. I took my first picture. He said, well, let's bring people in. I said, oh, it's portable. I mean, that's kind of the level, you know. Um, so, uh, again, uh, another example of how lucky I was to be surrounded by the organization and the people in it that uh, allowed, you know, a crazy kid like me to present my ideas uh, to levels of management that I would never, never, never get a chance to talk to, you know, kind of thing. But that for me is part of our chat that I wanted to get our audience, those people who work, we've a lot of people who work in R&D and to realize and see the, the themes that are transferable from your experience. And because history repeats itself, and 
I thought that this is a really important lesson that the things you had a supporting leader, the leader wasn't afraid to present you with this cannibalizing idea to the upper management and actually supported you, which is really unusual. You know, I, I thought about that as a scene in the movie. And, you, you know, it's like, hey, boss, I'm after discovering this thing. It's secret formula. And it's like, going, does anybody else know about this assassin? And you're like, no. And then he's like, pulls out a gun and shoots you <laughs> it's like we'll now nobody will ever know and film will rail forever and i i thought about that as actually you know something that, something that, 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 psych- that yeah, <laughs> but psychologically that can happen in an organization it's like well i'll sell, send steve on all these wild goose chases showing his camera to everybody and we'll just kill it by frustration but i, I wanted to dig into the the those meetings so as you pushed around the camera, as you as you introduced it in the different boardrooms, what kind of comments came back from people? Because I, 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 when I see it, I mean, it's it's magnificent and it's in the Smithsonian Museum in, in, in the US now in New York. It's available there to see the Museum of Modern History. And it is, it reminded me of the Buckminster Fuller quote, I'm sure you're a fan of Bookie. He said, there's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. So a lot of people, I'm sure, would have criticized it in its, in its minimal viable product form and actually kind of go, no, I, I, can't, I can't get my head around it, I can't see it. That's just one thing I wanted to see, did that happen? Also then, those who had a vested interest in the status quo remaining the status quo obviously are going to kill it because they're, getting, they're, getting benef- they're benefiting from the present remaining as it is, stocks coming in film is is leads the way they don't want this thing to get there so i'd love a few if you if you can remember a few of those instances a few of those those memories of people and their comments back to you because we've all been there in roles of head of innovation or change roles when the critics start to come out sure yeah i remember i remember those meetings uh, quite clearly i wish i had kept notes on them but you understand <laughs> not many people were interested in this at the time but what i used to do is i if you've seen pictures of this thing, it was about the size of a toaster. I would fold this thing up and I would uh, walk into a conference room, which was just down the hallway from it. it was th- picture a conference room about uh, 12 feet wide, 20 feet long, long table down the middle, and people would be sitting on either side, none of which I knew. Um, Gareth would have invited them typically, uh, or the management of the lab would have invited them because it started going up. We got more and more important people as time went on. <laughs> this took place starting in about January of 1976 and probably ended around June 76. We showed it to all kinds of groups of people. But I would walk in and I would take a picture of the, who was ever sitting in the, f- uh, the first seat on the right side of the table, head and shoulder shot. And then the tape would start to run. Was, the picture was captured in 50 milliseconds, available light. Um, black and white picture. Uh, and then uh, if, when the tape was moving, it would take 23 seconds to record the stored image that was in the DRAM in the, in the camera into the, onto the more permanent form, which was the tape. Um, and, and so I would describe to, to cleverly hide the fact that I couldn't take another picture for another 23 seconds or so. Um, I, I would describe what this thing was because it's like, People have never seen anything quite like this before. And then I would take the, a picture of the person who was sitting on the left side um, of the table, uh, same head and shoulder shot. Then I would put the camera down. And when the tape started, stopped moving 23 seconds later, I would pop the tape out and hand it to Jim, Jim Schickler, the person I work with. And he would put it into the playback unit, which we also built, which was a big part of this project, by the way, which would take the information off this tape, read it in, reconfigure it into a television signal and display it on a television set. And the television set I had stolen from another lab down the hall. So there it was sitting there. So that's, that, was the, that was the presentation. Now, I, I did have a lot of slides, but I never got to the slides because once the picture went up, the question started, right? And it gets, it gets to the root of your question. What kind of questions? Well, first of all, the... the um, the questions I was anticipating, being a young technologist, was how did I get all this technology into this box and all work together? Because I was using digital technology, analog technology, magnetic technology, optical technology, optoelectronics, all kinds of stuff that had never really been put together before in something like this. So I expected they asked me how I got it to work. 
They didn't ask me how, they asked me why. Why would anybody want to take their pictures this way? Well, I really hadn't thought about it too much. My, my, my dream was, to be honest with you, I, I didn't like film. You know, when I first came to Kodak, they, they taught me how to use, how to develop film and go down the laboratory and would mix all the chemicals. And I did this for several classes. And to me, it wasn't modern. I don't know. I, I was brought up in Star Trek world, you know. <laughs> yeah. there, there was no there was no paper on the bridge of this starship enterprise. <laughs> you know, I mean, my idea was it, it, modern was without that, right? So I thought if I could just the only thing I would consume was a few joules of energy in capturing an image. That was kind of my thing, right? I didn't want to I didn't want to consume any materials, right? Um, and so that, that was now. I hadn't really thought about the profit and the business model of the company I was working in, to be honest with you. <laughs> but that's that came up. Okay, that came up. Depending upon who the person was, that sort of reflected the type of question you got. I'll give you some examples. If it was a marketing guy, I remember there was a marketing fellow. He was from Consumer Imaging. And I had used analogies in my description of this because you can't really I don't have any data to describe how this thing might evolve. I could I could dream about it, but I had no data to support it. So I said, picture the camera eventually being like a calculator, which was just sort of becoming available. The HP 35 calculator was available and engineers were using it. And I thought, well, a calculator with a lens. I said, picture this as eventually a calculator with a lens because it was a digital product. You know, and, and by the way, the fact that this was camera was all digital worked against me tremendously because digital, I was, I was suggesting this as a consumer replacement for photography. Consumer product, well, that's bad enough, but digital consumer product, there were no digital consumer products. Digital technology was esoteric, expensive, complicated. Nobody understood. It just wasn't there, right? So, and this was completely digital. So, so that was going against me. But I said, well, think of it as a calculator, which was the only digital product I could think of. Um, at, with a lens, right? And then uh, uh, the playback unit was also a computer as such. Microprocessors were just coming out. And I, I had discovered that uh, Steve Wozniak could use the same DRAMs I had used. And so I found his, they were, the Apple board was starting to come out around this time. So I said, well, here's the, uh, we could use an Apple board perhaps like this. Now it's a lie because the architecture would never have worked on what I was trying to do. But the fact is I, I was desperate. So I, I was looking for these analogies of things that were happening right now. Uh, and so I used the calculator and the Apple board. You know, and I said, so then this marketing guy, depending on where you are, marketing guy, present day, how do I sell this to people, right? He goes to me, he says, well, how much for the compute, how much for the uh, calculator? About 400 bucks. How much for the for the board from like the, the, the guys from California? It was about 700 bucks. So I said, so for 1100 bucks, you can take way worse pictures than a fully loaded Instamatic that sells for $35. Why are we talking about this? So that that that's one perspective. Okay. I remember that direct question. Now there was another perspective that was given by people who were trying to implement this technology in different applications. And there was one fellow from business imaging who came one time. And he listened to my talk, he showed me, I took pictures, and then he just got up, stood up, I remember him standing up, he took out a check from his pocket and slammed it down on the table, said, take a picture of that. So I did, took a picture of a check, available light right on the page, popped up on the screen. He walked over to the screen, and then he just said two things that I remember. One, he said, resolution is not there, we need more resolution, okay. No argument there, right? I had a hundred by a hundred array. But then he looked to the other people in the room and he said, this thing works better than whole rooms full of equipment I've seen in other parts of this company. Why is that? I mean, he's this kid, 25 years old. Who the hell is this guy, right? So, so it, it, was, it, it, was, it was a forward looking thing. Like I'm looking for a solution and I looked at all the normal places and all of a sudden this crazy kid over here has got a solution that's way better than anybody else. And everybody's poo-pooing it. Why is he even here if it's so improbable, right? And then he was also telling me it's not good enough for what my application. But if you increase the resolution, I'd be interested in this. So that was a forward-looking way to look at it, right? So that's just two, two examples. Depending upon who you were and what your role in life was, <laughs> you know, I was challenged by what's going to happen to the photo finisher. Because 
kind of didn't need a photo finisher, right? And, and I remember them asking me that. They said, well, what happened to our whole photo finishing business, right? And I said, well, they could sell batteries. You know, that answer did not go over well at all, right? But I didn't know what else to say because I was thinking I wasn't selling consumables anymore, you know? I, I, so so it, it, all, it all depended on where you were coming from, which generated the type of question that I got. Man, th- that is one, I'm so grateful for you telling those stories because that is one of the biggest challenges with an innovator or a change maker is that everybody sees it from their own perspective. Everybody sees the threat or the opportunity differently. Mostly see it, most see it as a threat. But I, I thought about the different characters because those of us who've worked in change, we all know that different character that you just mentioned. We're kind of thinking and going, oh yeah, that was Jenny and that was Mar- Mark. And you know, you start to think of these people. Was there anybody, you know, this character who watches, stays quiet, sits there, ponders, rubs their chin perhaps, and then lets the room clear and then go, Steve, hi, I'm Aiden, <laughs> you know, and then start to go, I'm really interested in this. How can I get involved? Those type of people, because that, that's usually where the movement starts is those people who stay behind. They don't want to take over the room speaking, you know, like the Czech guy, but they're interested, but they try to come from a different point of view. I'd love if there was a story there because those, they're really interested in these stories because they're so, they're archetypes of innovation, of supporters or retractors, detractors. I'll, 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 again, I don't want to bore your audience with all these different stories, but I'll, I'll share two, two, two stories. One happened after one of my meetings, um, we were presenting to some of the corporate research lab people. Uh, I was in a research lab just to give some clarification. The lab I was in was part of the Kodak Apparatus Division. That was the division that designed and manufactured all the equipment that utilized the sensitized goods that was generated by the other big portion of Kodak, which was called Kodak Park. So we designed cameras, projectors, all the photo finishing equipment, all that kind of stuff was there. And so, uh, but there was a corporate lab that was a much bigger research laboratory, and they were looked to by the management of the company as the place where innovation was supposed to come from ideas. Not that innovation couldn't come from anywhere, but, you know, that was the research lab. So that's what you do. And there's a long history of Kodak and corporate research that George Eastman was one of the biggest proponents of before anybody else was. So so it's a long history of that. Anyway, one of the lab heads after my presentation, I remember he came up to me and he looked at me, he says, very nice to meet you. He says, you're, he says, you're very young. He said, it's quite an accomplishment for such a young person you know, kind of thing. So I, I, I remember being, you know, gratified that someone would recognize it. Um, um, I wasn't thinking about it as a great accomplishment. This was, again, just the kid from Brooklyn building stuff, right? But, but he recognized that innovation was coming from somewhere. He was supposed to sort of be like the steward of this, and here it was coming from left field. And he kind of appreciated it. You know, it's sort of like humbling to them. So in a sense of you talking about the person sitting in the room quietly stroking the chin and saying, well, how to get it involved? Here was a person saying, um, cool, I, I, you know, I'm surprised and I shouldn't be, but I am that this is coming from this part of the world. So that was a good, that was, that was a, a nice memory for me. Okay. Um, the other story is, has to do with high management. The highest management we ever showed this to um, uh, was the head of the apparatus division. So this is the guy in charge of basically half of Kodak, right? And he he had a special meeting where he came to my lab late at night, like at six o'clock or something. And Gareth invited him and met him and they brought him into the lab. And I took his picture in the lab. You know, he didn't want to be in a room with anybody else. And um, and he, um, he looked at it. He looked very carefully at it, actually. I remember he looked... I took a picture and he caught his caught his hand and he had his uh, wedding ring on there and there was a reflection of the wedding ring. I remember him looking very closely at the picture and he said, "What's that?" And I said, "That's your wedding ring." He looked at it. Oh, oh yeah, okay. So it was a real picture of him, you know, kind of thing. And then on the way out, and I didn't hear this directly, but I heard this from Gareth Lloyd's um, uh, wife, who many many years later told me this story. As they were leaving the lab, just Gareth and this this manager. Um, he asked, should we keep working on this? You know, because yeah, a lot of pushback, right? Kind of interesting idea, but 
you know, not that popular. And uh, he looked at him and he, and he said, Gareth told his wife this later on. So that's how I got the story. He said, yeah, keep working on it. I hope you fail. And they walked out. Right? So there was encouragement and a clear, clear indication that he didn't like what he saw in the sense of strategically where it was going because we were not ready for this kind of thing. Right? And nobody knew how long it was going to take. I was asked all the time. How long is this going to take until this is practically going to be a solution for photography? I, I, again, I hadn't really thought about a lot of this stuff, but when you get asked that same question, you know, in every meeting by every person. So I, I used Moore's law. Gordon Moore had come up with this rule about how um, largely digital technology was going to advance every 18 months to two years in doubling. Um, and um, I said, well, this is all digital. So why don't I apply this? I called up the research laboratory, the corporate research laboratories, and I said, I even have these notes in a notebook of mine when I had this phone call. And I called one of the senior guys there and I said, how many pixels would I need in order to be equivalent to the worst consumer film format I could find, which was 110 film format, which wasn't a great film format, but I was desperate. So I said, how many pixels would I need? Oh, that's easy. A million pixels, two million if you want color. I had 10,000 pixels on this imager, right? And I had no color, right? But I'm desperate. So I used Moore's law to extrapolate how many, you know, if I did the same thing with 2 million pixels, how long would it take me to get there with following digital technologies learning curve? And I came up with between 15 and 20 years. You know, the number I came up with was a little bit less than that, but I said 15 to 20 years not knowing if CCD technology at all would follow Moore's law because it's a little different. Moore has assumed certain things in terms of line widths and digital technology and, and, and CCD was a transducer. So it had to take light and convert it. So, but you know, I didn't, I, I needed an answer. So I, I, I used that as an, a, as a, as a benchmark. And I, I said 15 to 20 years. Now, when you tell an audience 15 to 20 years, again, depending upon who they are, <laughs> how old they are and what they're doing, they have different reactions, right? Um, and so if you're, if you're a senior manager, you know, you know in 15, 20 years, you're probably not going to be at Kodak. That's one thing. You, you could be a strategic planner or a young person and you're thinking, wow, I should really worry about this, right? Because this is within a lifetime, you know, kind of thing. And then you could also challenge the, the estimate. And it turns out that we launched our first digital consumer camera 18 years later. So it wasn't a bad estimate, but for all the wrong reasons. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I was completely guessing, you know, kind of thing. But the point was, it was a long time. And if you're in corporate America, you know that, especially even today, back then it was a little bit longer, but even today, you know, if you have, if you have a, a, an expectation of making a profit in less than three years, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> they, they lose, they lose, uh, they lose interest, you know. But 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 this was this was going to be a generation uh, of activity, and that was only until we the first camera came out. Until it started really impacting film was another ten years after that. So so really it was a, it was it was a working lifetime uh, in order for this to 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 actually happen. And there was a lot of question whether it would happen or not. Um, I will tell you, I was ever since 1976, I was of the firm belief it would happen. I didn't know if it would happen in my lifetime, but I knew it would happen because it was just, there was too much going in this direction, you know, but a lot of people at Kodak didn't want it to happen for obvious reasons. I thought about those senior execs you mentioned and that whole idea of um, asking you when and the intention behind that question. So I'm sure they ask you that question. I can picture them leaning forward in the chair and then you go 15, 20 years. And then it's like, oh, and they lean back with relief because it reminded me of a line, there's this French expression that's attributed to Madame de Pompadour, who's this, the lover of Louis XV of France. And she said, après moi la déluge, which means after me, the flood, right? And what I, th what I use it for actually is in, in writing is to go, this is what happens in a lot of organizations, 15 to 20 years, I'll be out of there, I'll be gone, who cares if it happens? And, you know, I, I often think about this, even with the planet, the way we did, destroying the planet for future generations and it's going well but your kids and your grandkids are going to have to deal with that but that was one thing that just dawned on me but i wanted to bring it back to something else because i'm sure you've seen this so fast forward 
to other examples, great examples of disruption. Because I wanted to get a feel, you're a, you dedicated so much of your life to Kodak, you created such amazing products. When we read about these things, like for example, one of the case studies I talk about in my book is Nokia. And what happened in Nokia was a similar thing, Steve, now it wasn't so quite far ahead as you, but some of the R&D executives in Nokia presented the idea of a tablet, a touchscreen phone and an app store as a new revenue line to senior executives in Nokia. And they were told, that's cute. Keep quiet about it type of thing. Why are you distracting us? We're making money from the Nokia 3310. That's one. The other then to go that this is common. This is so common to so many innovators out there to know this resistance to change is so natural was Henry Ford. So when Henry Ford was presented a new prototype for a new type of Model T, this great innovator who brought us the car, who said that when they, I asked them what they want, they would have said faster horses. What does he do when he's shown the prototype by that, you know, 1800s version of Steve Sasson? He says nothing, picks up a hammer and smashes it to pieces. So that's the, that's the reality of this that trickles back all the way back in time. And I thought that that w must have got into your mind in some way that it was disappointing and frustrating. What kind of emotions came up when you're like, um, if only they listened to me, or if only they engaged, or if only they built this. I think about that sliding door moment, like a what if a leader grabbed it. And before we came on air, you were telling me about the CEO at the time you, you met previously, and you had a moment, I, I thought this was a really important point, that from his vantage point, he had massive frustrations with this, he had to deal with a hell of a lot. And this is such a difficulty for so many CEOs and organizations. Yes, you have the marketing team and those innovation guys you talked about and all their vantage points. But the CEO has a very different one. Do they manage the profits today and manage Wall Street? Or do they cannibalize the business and try and have a dual approach to innovation? Very difficult for CEOs. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd ever be a successful CEO, because I, I think the number of things that they have to to deal with. And I had an opportunity, the great pleasure of, of knowing and, and talking to uh, at least the last three CEOs. Actually, during most of my career, I never met the CEO because Kodak was a very, um, uh, I don't know, sort of a little bit of an aristocracy to some extent. Yeah, just be very virtual. Remember, this company is 100 years old. They've been very successful for this time. So, you know, all the, the rules and, and the little idiosyncrasies and, and some of the arrogance was well founded. I mean, they have done quite well for a long time. I mean, how many companies do you know that have been that successful? And Kodak was very successful, very profitable uh, for 100 years. You know, this is this is so that level of self-assuredness that we've got the right formula um, was kind of well founded. You know, so so I don't want to I don't want to take away any of that, but of the CEOs that I had the very distinct pleasure of of talking to at different times about digital imaging, they struggled very much with the culture, the culture of the company, not the technology, the culture. The culture was one of you know this is the way we do things kind of thing. We were very good on process. Kodak always had the biggest books on every process known to man. And, and to some extent, that's understandable because what was the key to our success? Photographic film, an extremely complex pro uh, product that required an extremely detailed and very precise process of formulating and coding very thin chemicals on big webs flying at hundreds of feet per second. <laughs> In the dark, you know, kind of. So this is this is something that that really required precision. So we wrote a lot of process around that, right? And all in secret and everything. So so to some extent, you got to understand that's the environment that we were coming from, okay? But the 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 the, the CEOs always struggled with. Okay, now I see change coming. And the first CEO that I had an opportunity to talk to at least a little bit about this was George Fisher. He was the first CEO that came from outside of Kodak. So. Previous to this, all of the CEOs had been born and raised inside of Kodak, and largely from the from the the you know 
silver halide side of the business, you know, the film side of the business, because that's where the money was. So to some extent, when he arrived, he had to look at this culture and say, well, how is this culture going to react to the changes that are coming? Because it was clear that they were coming. He came in the, in the early to mid 90s. Um, and so, you know, there were all kinds of stories about how he would, you know, say things in meetings with all his executives to see, you know, that were blatantly false and to see who would who would object, who would who would who would say he's wrong just to see if anybody would say he was wrong. You know, that kind of thing. Right. So so there's that kind of story. And then I you know, I knew Dan Karp. I actually had known Dan Karp because he had been uh, the leader of the business unit that I was in in the 1980s. That was one of the first electronics imaging business units. And so I got to know him a little bit there and um, played a little basketball with him and stuff. So I got to know him a little bit better. And, you know, I remember having lunch with him one time and he struggled very much with um, people coming in with new film programs, you know, in the late 1990s. You know, is that really going to do the company much good, you know, kind of thing. And he realized that he didn't know a lot about the emerging technology. He had been brought up in Kodak as well, film, film and marketing. So, so these are these CEOs are human beings um, first. Um, they're smart guys. Um, they try to take everything into account. They're balancing all these counter forces of Wall Street demanding dividends and and research guys saying you shouldn't invest in this anymore, and a middle management structure that is based on incentives of selling the present product. You know, and and um, it's hard to make as I think Colby Chandler said, make the elephant dance, you know? Um, so um, those were kind of the, all the, you know, the, the complicating factors that I saw that they, they were, they were dealing with. Um, but it was largely a culture that had been successful for a hundred years that was resistant to change. That was, I think the biggest challenge. And we, we somehow think that the CEO can make magically snap his or her fingers and make it all go away. And I, I don't, don't think that's true. Steve, in preparation for today, I read Harvard Business Case Studies, New York Times articles, and whatever articles and podcasts, including, as I said, Mahan's partner in leadership podcast that you did with him. But there was one article that I read, and it was in 2008. And you left the company in 2009. And this line from that 2008 article in the New York Times by Claudia Do Deutsch, it was entitled, At Kodak, Some Old Things Are New Again. And it really tugged at my heart, Steve. It said, th I pulled a quote that said, Kodak is by no means thriving. So this is before it goes bankrupt a few years later. Digital products are nowhere near filling the profit vacuum left by evaporating sales of film. Its workforce is about a fifth of the size it was two decades ago and it continues to lose money, its share price remains depressed. But finally, digital products are flowing from the labs. I thought about you there. And I thought about your colleagues who were like chicken little saying the sky's falling down when it actually was, and how frustrating that would have been. And I, I wondered with that line, did you ever think that if it was positioned differently, apart from the culture, could they have bought it within the organization? Because there's idea sellers, which was what you were, and then there's idea buyers, and the buyers are so much more important. And I wonder sometimes, was it, did it ever stand a chance? Was it how it was positioned? Is there anything that you think you could have done differently? Not you, but the organization could have done differently in order to let this idea flow through and be ahead of the curve rather than a follower once all the competitors came on the marketplace. I've thought about that question a lot, and I have to apologize because my answer doesn't reflect that. But, um, you know, the fact is that um, there was always any time we offered a, a, a digital solution. And by the way, so many people worked at Kodak on this, uh, really smart people uh, in, in all different phases, not just in digital cameras, but in digital printing and in, in photo finishing and, and all of these kind of things. And so there was a lot of people that were, were, were somewhat frustrated. I could share all kinds of stories of meetings I had with people that were just so frustrated that they weren't putting more emphasis on this digital approach to photo finishing, for example, you know, or, or, or kiosks or that's, that kind of stuff. Um, that was always a big challenge. But, but the problem was 
you were always compared to the profitability of selling film. You know, one of the worst things for a company uh, is that if they're really successful in one field to innovate their way out of it, because being successful means that you've got a big barrier to overcome. I mean, I don't think it's a big surprise to anyone in your audience that photographic film was one of the most profitable consumer products ever devised by man. Okay. The large barrier to entry, very few people could compete in the field. Everybody was using film. You had a customer experience that required three customer touch points for every photographic experience. The first one you bought the film, second one you brought it back for photo finishing, and third when you picked up your prints. Think about that. Three photographic, three, three customer touch points experiences for every single use of your product. I mean, it's just extraordinary, right? So when you come up with a digital approach to something and it didn't have that, what kind of financial model could you offer the the, the business unit people that could compete with it. Not to mention the fact that film was pretty, when you sold a roll of film, that was it. The infrastructure was there. There was no reliability issues. There was no learning curve. And when you sold a digital camera in the 1990s, it was it was like a chain of pain just to get a print. We used to call it the chain of pain. You know, so it was a learning curve. It was reliability issues. It was you know, we had special classes, all the expenses with respect to that. The fact that we didn't, you know, even our marketing people didn't know a lot about it, you know. So, and it was a fast moving field too. <laughs> you know, what was done in one year, two, 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 three years later, you had different competitors with different technologies, with different advantages. Um, so it was it was a mind bogglingly difficult sell to, to come up with a business model that could even remotely come close to what photographic film would do in the conventional way. So that was really the difficulty, uh, in my opinion. And, and you, you quest, your question to the heart of your question was, could this have ever been successfully done inside of the company, inside a use and Kodak company? I think it would have been very, very difficult, uh, very difficult, because we were so successful right up until the end. I remember we used to have, we used to sit around, some of the guys, we'd sit around at lunch and we'd figure out when is film going to die, right? You know, because we were all digital guys, you know, and, and I always thought it would be around the year 2000, you know. I'd say we go to our local, we have a store in Rochester called Wegmans. So I'd say go to Wegmans and, and there'll be a digital camera selling at the blister pack at the checkout counter. You know, that, that's when you know you're gone, right? <laughs> and I mean, we were, we were just saying it, it, it's going to take that in order for them to move, to change. Because remember, th- the best year of film sales was in 1998, as I remember. You can check that out. But I think it was right around then. So in addition to during the early 90s, when this was really starting to take off, Jim McGarvey and his team had done a marvelous job in developing DSLRs. And we were using Nikon bodies and then Canon bodies, but we were doing it, right? We were selling them to, to photo, photo journalists and things. Consumer imaging was Apple computer came to us. And we developed the, the Quick Take 100, um, you know, for the Apple computer, you know, and Apple it said Apple on it, but we designed it and developed it. We wouldn't tell anybody we did it because we didn't want to be, you know, on the wrong side of that discussion. But we were we were there, right? But but you know, <laughs> but film was doing quite fine, you know. So the technology was marching, but the profitability wasn't there. And and so so you hung with it until until it fell off a cliff. And we were trying to guess when that cliff was. I was guessing around the year two thousand. And the cliff really didn't happen until about five years after that or so. Um, and then when it did, it was a cliff. I think film fell off sales about 18 to 20% a year if, you know, at that point. And so it was a tough sell being in a successful company. And I don't know if, if, if internally we could have done that. Now, maybe there would have been a model where you had somebody come in and, you know, either kill all the electronics guys and turn us into a photographic film company forever or kill all the film guys and turn us into a Silicon Valley company. But it might have taken something like that in order to make this transition. But you always had the business model challenge. And it was a difficult one to overcome because film was so successful. One of the last questions I have for you, and it's because I think of you as a later, latter year Edison in so many ways in that 
your desire to fail your way to success. I've heard you say this in, in other interviews, although you didn't use those words. And I see behind you two Edison books. So he's obviously a hero of yours. He is a hero of mine, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I wondered about this, because if you think about when you tinkered in Kodak, when you were 24, 23, 24, 25, tinkering around inventing this camera, there was no pressure on you, there was no stress, there was no burning platform. But then fast forward later into the noughties, when the burning platform's there, the reason I, I contextualize like that is the difference in the mindset of the organization when it goes from the thrive state, when it's in this comfortable state where it's making money to this survive state where it's literally in stress. And I often think about how the body reacts to this. So when you're in this fight or flight response, blood's diverted from your forebrain to your fists for fight and your feet for flight, your digestion slows, your blood thickens, you prepare for war, for battle and you literally become less intelligent. So your decision making is flawed. And I wondered how that affected if, it, if that was the corporate mindset in this fight or flight mode, how did it affect appetite for failure? Because I often think about this appetite for the failure changes, dependent on the circumstances. And I'm sure you felt that the pressure, well, in the early days, when you're in this kind of thrive state, where there's no pressure, no timelines, because you mentioned this, there was no structure, etc. That was probably a good thing. I, I'm sure people are going on what I wouldn't give to have to not give a review every week of my project. I'd love your thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, in addition to in the thrive state in the 70s, um, you know, it was a very informal kind of a thing. I had a lot of freedom. Uh, the only pressure I had was what I put on myself, I kept saying to myself, you know, when I was shaving in the morning, you know, yeah, sure, I'm going to build this stupid camera. What gave me the idea? I think I could do this, you know, kind of. But the fact is, if I had failed totally, no one would have noticed, you know, uh, I had no reputation to protect. Uh, you know? So in a sense, it was an ideal situation. But now when you get to the, to, to the 90s, I would say, when we had all these, Kodak, remember, it was a very rich company. They could afford failures. And they had a lot of failures. You know, we, we tried Super 8 movie cameras for a while. That didn't work out. We tried. We were in and out of inkjet printing a number of times. Um, I remember some of the managers used to say, we're the only company that could, have fared, you know, could afford to fail like this, right? So it wasn't that we couldn't afford the failure. I think what we did is we didn't learn from the failures and keep to the mission. We would walk away. From the failure. Well, this isn't going to go. You know, this isn't going to do it. So let's try something else, right? We 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 stuck with digital cameras for a long time. Um, we we had done some very innovative work in terms of intellectual property. We had defined how digital cameras would work. You know, a lot of people don't realize that, but the, the, all the patents associated with like these cell phone cameras and stuff, lots of them originated at Kodak. They were actually part of all the litigation that took place in the early 2000s. And just about every camera company, cell phone manufacturer, I think, has licensed Kodak intellectual property. Because we, again, going back to what I talked about before, we knew a lot about the problem to be solved. That's independent of the technology. We knew how good it had to be. We knew how it would have to work. We knew what people would accept. We didn't know how to do it. Okay. And that's what took 20, 30 years. Right. So, you know, in that sense, uh, the panic started to come in in terms of when you get into uh, into this nervous part of the world and start making like bad decisions, we would run away from stuff, I think. We wouldn't stick with it. We would say, well, that failed. Let's try something else because somebody would promise something else, you know, instead of, no, we didn't make it here. Let's keep going on there. We, we stuck with digital DSLRs for quite some time until the early 2000s. And then we get out of that business simply because we didn't make any money at it. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that we were dumb. We, we, we kept trying. We couldn't make any money at it because the money in digital cameras, as you might expect, is in the lenses and the accessories and things like that. And, and we weren't in that business, right? So to some extent, it was a rational business decision to, to abandon some of this stuff. But in other senses, we should have adopted more of the business model and been broader thinking about how we were going to make money. Kodak was offering online photo finishing services before anybody else. You know, we talk about Instagram and things like that, but Kodak was there before they were. 
But why was Instagram successful? Because Instagram realized it was more of a social experience than selling media that is a print, right? Um, and and so we were we were stuck in the paradigm. Well, we've got to sell some material to somebody. <laughs> that I understand, right? And so now it's clicks, you know. So we should have been thinking a little bit broader in terms of how the customer is going to change what they value. The customer started to, with digital photography. The customer valued the experience, the immediacy, as opposed to the image quality. They would take a, a, a an inferior picture. If you compare it to a Kodachrome slide to a, a, a mid-1990s digital camera, the digital camera picture was far inferior. But they started buying them because they could look at the picture right away or they could send it to somebody else or, oh, the internet is coming. Now we can share it to everybody, right? It becomes easier to share. So now we're sharing an experience. We're, 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 we're sharing our life more immediately. Well, that was a new concept. We hadn't really thought about that. So I think if we had thought a little bit broader about how the world was changing in many different ways, not just with respect to how pictures are viewed and sold and materials and that kind of thing, but how people were going to enjoy the experience of sharing an image right away, as opposed to having a beautiful Kodachrome negative, all right? That, 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 that thinking that way would have, would have perhaps given us some insight into business models that would have at least sustained us a bit more. Steve, one last uh, major question for you, uh, because it's, it's threefold, well, directed at three different characters in this story, is the budding Steve Sassons out there. So in today's organizations, there's versions of you out there trying to push an idea, trying to reinvent their organization. A message for that person of encouragement or something you wish somebody said to you back then, that's one. The second is then for the buyers of the ideas, to, you know, those people who are listening to those pitches that you gave back there, those demonstrations back in the day. And then the third is for the CEO of today in this world where Moore's laws got quicker and quicker. We are experiencing these disruptions, these bankruptcies quicker than ever before. Those three cohorts of people, what's your message for each of those? Okay, let's start with the first one as an individual innovator. I think what sustained me the most and there was a lot of negative pushback on this idea for decades, okay? But what sustained me was not that I felt like I was never the smartest person in the room. There were so many, so many smarter people than me at Kodak in different fields. However, I, 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 I never got an argument from any of those smart people that could tell me that the idea was impossible, that there was some law of physics, some law of thermodynamics that would prohibit this from happening. That never happened. And I was always looking for that. So, to, you know, in other words, don't give me an opinion. Give me some law of physics that says it's never going to happen. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to understand that by it, right? And no one could ever do that. So that's what sustained me in light of the fact that even experts were saying, well, it would take, you know, this will never happen. That'll never happen. They're just saying that based on a bias they may have or a present understanding of the limits of a certain field, for example. Remember, experts are, 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 are really there to tell you what the limits of operation, the present limits of operation of the field are, right? And innovators are for the people who jump way beyond that and say, well, what if I did this? It's imagination as opposed to, you know, working out equations, but, but to some extent. So that sustained, that sustained me. And, and I think if you can get to that level, that can sustain you because, um, you know, today I think ideas are shorter. You spend less time in limbo. Or what will happen is uh, an idea will be challenged and then they may walk away from the idea and then they'll come back to it two years later because some other technology has come into play or some new platform has come into play that allows you now to do something that you couldn't do before or you didn't think about before. You know, So the idea is still the same. It's just the implementation options have changed. Okay, And so you keep your idea fixed in your mind and be flexible about the implementation operations. So that that if that's that would be the the best answer I could give to the first part of the question. The second part of the question was about the the buyers, basically. Yeah. So those, those the marketing people, the sales people, those people who witnessed your demonstrations. Yeah. Those 
you know, those are really good guys uh, and, and girls. They, 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 they are, um, they are struggling with dealing with the everyday problems of selling product or marketing product or finding the heart of the, the heartbeat of the customer. Okay. So I don't want to discount what their hesitations are because they're trying to say, put themselves in the place of the average consumer. And the average consumer is going to be resistant to change. I mean, their life is not spent around taking pictures. It's something they just want to pick up and go out and do and be successful. And that's it. Right. So to some extent, they try to simplify the operation, try to be the advocate for that customer. But remember that your customer is going to change on you. Okay. What you think is their behavior is not going to be their behavior forever. And something will change it. Something will change their priority. Something will change in the infrastructure that will allow them to think about it. If I can share one story, I'll share a personal story. My daughter one time was going to see a boy band at the Darien Lake near Rochester. And I had to pick her up, which was a maddening experience. And I had to, she was a teenager and her and her girlfriends got in the back of the car and they were all excited. They had their cell phones and they had taken pictures and videos of it. And they were just all excited. And they were selling them to their friends and stuff. This was in the early 2000s or so. And um, uh, I was shocked at how horrible these pictures were. I was shocked at how horrible the video was. The audio was atrocious and they loved it. And they loved it because they were sharing it with their friends right away. And that, that was everything to them. And to me, it was all about the fidelity of the, of the image that you captured or the audio that you captured. That has to have something to do with it. Well, the customers changed because you gave them a new option. And I think as a marketing guy, you have to be aware of that. You spend so much time trying to figure out where the customer is and you don't anticipate where they're going to be. And, and you have to be a little futuristic about it. You have to take a little bit of a risk about it. Marketing people don't want to be wrong because if they're wrong, you know, sales go out. But you've got to be thinking about where they're going to go. And it'll come sometimes way faster than you think. So I think that's the, 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 the guy. When you're sure you've got the, the pulse of the customer, just say, what if? What if? You know, and, 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 and do, do, do some mind games. Do some scenario games. Think of impossible stuff because sooner or later it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. And the third, what was the third part of the, oh, the CEO. Yeah. I, you know, I, I have less advice for CEO because I have just sympathy for those guys. I, I just, I, I can't tell you how, how difficult I think their job is because they're, 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 they've got this sort of duality of managing the legacy of the company, you know, and, and the, the present state of the company. And then, Where's the company going to be in the future, you know? And how do I make investments today that are probably not going to be viewed very favorably by the present investment financial world? I remember Kodak, you know, in the early 90s and mid 90s, the financial press was very negative to Kodak's investment in digital photography. They, they weren't positive at all toward it. Now, of course, every time you read an article about, well, why didn't they, right? Yeah. Um, but, but to some extent, they are dealing with the present, you know, investment return for a, for a, for a, for a, for, a, for a, an investor, and I think the the CEO has to balance that dividend today, you know, the dividend on the next quarter, you know, which I know they spend a lot of time up in those lofty floors worried about the dividend for the next quarter, right? As opposed to where are we going to be in three to five years? And I think that's kind of their job, but I, I imagine it's almost impossible to do that because of all of the present day pressures that they have. So I, I, had, I don't know if I have good advice for them other than leaders have to lead. And that's not necessarily popular. Um, it's not necessarily well-regarded, um, um, but, you know, well, these books behind me are about people who led, and I'm sure they weren't all that popular during their lifetime. Well, thank you for leading, Steve. And uh, it's been such an amazing opportunity to speak to you. And I'm so grateful. And I'm, I'm so grateful for your humility. And you picked that up. You know, I, I noticed that when you even said about the teacher you had, he was humble, teach me something, you know, that obviously made an impact on you. And it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I just wanted to finish on on how it finished because in 
that same 2008 article I mentioned, the New York Times article, there's a quote from an investor at the time who said, this was a super tanker that came close to capsizing. And we know that four years later, you left in the interim in 2009, a company that was known as the great yellow father in Rochester, where you live now, went bankrupt. And as is so often the case, it was a little too little too late. And that's why I think your message is so important, so carries so much gravitas, having been there, having lived through it, having seen the experience, having been there for such a long time, a, a lot of innovators aren't there for such a long time. And I think that carries such a huge weight and a huge importance. And final thing, I, I don't have a, a great medal to award you with just because I wanted to let our audience in say that or know that in 2009, President Obama awarded you with the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. You've been recognized in so many articles and different societies across the states and across the world. And uh, I don't have anything to offer you except my thanks. And for those of you who are in New York or you're visiting New York, you can see Steve's invention on display in the Smithsonian Museum. And I highly encourage you to go there. Remember this, this conversation we had, I will always remember it was absolute joy. Steve, if people want to find you, if people want to reach out, maybe it's another media company, maybe it's somebody looking to talk to you, maybe it's somebody looking for a consultant, I don't know if you do that, where can they find you? Um, well, first, can, can I just add one thing? The actual prototype was at the Smithsonian down in Washington, D.C. Right. until a few years ago, but then they've moved it back. Um, museums are funny that way. And Kodak has a museum in Rochester uh, up at Kodak Park, a and the prototype is presently there. So I, I just wanted to add that. To okay, that. just that we but, don't but send people to the wrong place. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's a big difference between Washington, D.C. and Rochester, yeah. New York. It's like, I'll leave that one go kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I live in Rochester. Um, and I, 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 did, I did do some patent uh, consulting for, for a few years um, because the last few years of my career, I was involved in patent litigation and managing some patent uh, litigation projects for Kodak, and which was an interesting experience, by the way. It's not something I would really want to do for the rest of my life, but but, but it was an interesting experience because I got a chance to work with some excellent uh, licensing attorneys and patent attorneys, uh, uh, and get, you get a real appreciation for what for what they do. Um, so I, I did some of that. So I did, I did just some, some, some consulting. Um, and uh, my email, I can give out my email, I guess. I, I don't uh, know. Maybe not, Steve. I wouldn't bother. Yeah, you might right. get spammed. Yeah. I probably would Are you on LinkedIn or anything like that? Yes, I am on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yes, I am on LinkedIn. You can look me up there. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, I, 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 do, I do do some consulting. I do some speak public speaking. A lot of business people, uh, I talk to them, business schools sometimes because of, uh, just because of the experience, much like you're trying to get to the bottom here about, you know, how do you successfully navigate the innovation uh, challenges that, that we're facing today, which is, I like, way, way, um, way more challenging today than it was back in, back when I was involved with this kind of work, because, Things move so much quicker now, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm envious of the people today because they've got such great tools, but I'm not envious of the speed with which you have to work. <laughs> yeah. Steve Sasson, the inventor of the digital camera, it's been an absolute honor speaking to you. Thank you so much from The Innovation Show. Thank you very much for having me.